Hey, you absolute legends, it's Rick Carson and we're at the beautiful Make Believe Studios. And today we are gonna do something that I've been very excited to get into. And this new series segment is pretty much an in-depth dive into how I learn. You know, I have had some wonderful mentors throughout my career, but being located in Omaha, Nebraska for a large chunk of it, and really outside of major cities, a lot of the records I've made have been on my own or with people who were of the similar career status that I was, and I was always searching for more. I wanted to make records that sounded like the favorite records that I grew up with. So I was always trying to soak up as much information as I possibly could in articles and photos and videos that have come out. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of that today with these wonderful videos that have been released of the Rolling Stones inside Olympic Studios recording Sympathy for the Devil. And there's gonna be some overall decisions that we have to make and some assumptions that we're gonna to have to come to, but there's a lot of great information to be picked up here. And we're just gonna start right off by making some notes. So console, you know, if you look into it, Olympic was a Helios house. Keith Grant and Dick Sweetenham seem to have a pretty, you know, long-standing relationship. And there was a lot of stuff that went in there that was built by Dick for, for Keith. The later consoles were built by um, Rain Dirk and I believe then maybe DNR, but I know Rain Dirk had some consoles that were in there that had the Helios modules from the previous desks in there. And there was even an Olympic console that was built pre-Helios that was just known as the Olympic console. But either way, we're just going to assume Helios since we aren't able to see that. As far as any of the control room gear, we could get into that a little bit more, but right now we're gonna spe you know, specifically tend to look at the microphones and the instruments that are being utilized in the live room. That said, there's a lot of footage to go through and there's some questions that we have to answer, particularly who played the bass? Because in the video, there's multiple people playing the bass. And if we go and we Google that, sympathy for the devil, bass player, we are gonna see that Keith Richards played the bass. And he has spoken about this a lot. He played the bass on a lot of Rolling Stone songs. And you can see him and Bill both playing the bass in this, you know, wonderful, wonderful recording. And you will actually see that this is backed up by the video. Bill is playing the maracas while Keith is ripping it away on a beautiful Fender P bass. So let's just go in here and let's start out some notes. So we've got drums. We're gonna have a kick drum, probably. We're gonna have a snare drum, typically. In this, I can tell you that I, there isn't a snare drum. We're gonna have overhead mics, tom mics. We are gonna you know, have room mics, but in this situation, it doesn't really seem like there's a lot of room mics going on because of everything else that's happening. Um, from there, we're gonna have the bass, and we have some questions to ask ourselves. Amp. Microphone, DI. And the DI is a big qu question to really ask because you can see a couple different things in the video and I'll bring that up. From there, we're gonna get into guitars, keys, vocals. So let's just go ahead and see what we see by watching these videos and we're gonna be able to answer some questions right off the bat. So the first one that I wanna start with is this video that's called Sympathy for the Devil in the Beginning. And this, you can tell, is a couple of friends showing up to the studio and they are working out this song on acoustic guitars. And it's a pretty massive session. You can tell that there's a film crew. They've got pretty much every keyboard that they possibly could dragged into this room. They've got tons of mics up on stands that aren't being utilized. So let's go ahead and see what we can see and try and get through this stuff and figure out, you know, what's happening. So the first thing that we're gonna wanna take notice of happens right off the bat in this video. So I'm gonna pause pretty quick. Boom, and there we are. So we see a pretty good overview 
of this drum set. And the first thing that I wanna point out is this guy down here, which is our kick drum microphone. And from past experience, I can tell that this is a kick drum microphone made by AKG, which is called the D D12E. So let's just go and look up an AKG D12E. And we will go and see some older variants of that. Actually, you know, it may not be a D12E, it's just a standard D12 in the sense that, let's go back to it and let's double check. Oh, it's this clip. Oh, so it's not a D12. And we can tell that because of how the connector is made. Is that a D20? Yup. So you see how the connector on this microphone is hanging off the back of it and is a larger Tushel style connector. You can also see that it has a multi pat or a uh, roll off selector here. So let's go back to our microphone in the video. And you can see that that's pretty much the same setup that we have going on there. So we can go in and say that our kick drum microphone is an AKG D20. So let's go back to our clip and you can see here that there isn't, oh, maybe coming in from here, a snare drum microphone. But you'll see that these stands get utilized again as things progress. One thing to point out though, is that we have a Neumann U67 on overhead. So we're gonna go we're gonna throw that in because we see that right off the bat. Overhead. Neumann, uh, I'm spelling all this wrong. U67. Okay, I didn't see any Tom microphones. So we're gonna leave that out for now. We're gonna leave our snare blank for now. We're gonna keep going through the video. Boom. Next thing we see is a bunch of beautiful Gibson acoustic guitars. And we also see some Vox amplifiers. And we see Bill Wyman here with his bass. And this is a very interesting one because we see the cable of the bass run down to the floor. And the question that I have to ask myself there, is that a DI? And I'm gonna go and put a question mark because I've watched these videos. And as this progresses, you're gonna see something. So. We have another Vox over here. Let's see what is used in the videos that we see. When it comes to the acoustic guitars, this is the one I'm mo most focused on because this is the one that Brian Jones ends up playing later. We got a Mellotron hanging out back there. You can see he's just kind of strumming along. Maybe that's why he didn't end up playing the bass. Let's go to the next video. And this we'll watch later. This is an interesting video where they're just doing background vocals. But this is the, uh, the actual trailer. Evolutionary. And that is to give up being an intellectual. Okay, so this is a great clip. Um, I love checking this one out because one, you can see a couple of things. One to check out is the microphone, which is an AKG C412, I believe. AKG C412. Yep. 
like this. So let's go add that to our notes. Bass microphone, AKG C412. Okay, and then let's try and figure out that bass amp. Vox solid state amps 60s. So we're searching for Vox solid state amplifiers that were made in the 1960s. This one's pretty distinct in the sense that if you look at it, it's got these two knobs hanging right off the front and then these two power and it's also smaller. So it may not be solid state. I'm assuming it is. It looks like it's something from like this range of stuff, like this range of stuff. So that looks to me, we've got two knobs in the front and an input jack and then we've got five knobs up top. Five knobs up top, two knobs, looks like a pedal's hanging out of there. Okay, so I feel pretty solid in saying that that is probably, what we come up with? Um, a Vox Foundation bass guitar amplifier with 215 speakers. Okay, the DI, we're gonna leave that blank for right now. Let's keep going. So we're gonna get into some other stuff with this footage from the trailer. Oh, well, I guess we can talk about the bass. It's a beautiful 60s P bass. So, oh, wrong thing. Bass. One thing to note about the P bass that I will say is that since he has the cover on, he's got to make a conscientious decision if he's going to pick before or, you know, above or below the pickup. And you can see that he chooses to pick closer to the neck, which will, you know, influence the sound for everybody out there trying to get that bass sound, which is a very distinct part of sympathy for the devil. Okay, so we got Bill Wyman still on the bass. That'll change. So let's keep going, see where we got more studio footage. So. so this is an interesting one. This is a AKG D224, it looks like. Yep. Looks like that to me. I don't know why they didn't pull up, but looks like a AKG D224 to me going on those vocals. Let's go back. And the thing that is most distinct to me, you can see it's a little ring down here, but that clip gives it away clear as day. There isn't one of these up here with their clips, but if there was, let's go to images, you would see it because the, this is the wrong microphone, but that is the right clip. That is the D224 style clip right there. Um, so yeah, I recognize that microphone right away. And it's an interesting choice for what they're utilizing it for, which is for the scratch vocal while playing live with the band. Most people don't know about this microphone. I've done a video about it before briefly, but it's an absolutely tremendous dynamic microphone. It's one of the best dual diaphragm condenser micro or dual diaphragm dynamic microphones that I've ever come across. There's a diaphragm for the low frequencies and a diaphragm for the high frequencies. It makes it have almost a condenser like sensitivity that given the, you know, the downside of the microphone is that that high frequency capsule is incredibly fragile and there's no one in the world that has the very fine wear that is used to fix these anymore. So once they break, they break. We thankfully have three of them. I don't utilize them that often because of the whole scared of them breaking. But it's wonderful to see that it's being utilized here for this, this purpose because, you know, it has incredible 
frequency response, but also has great, great rejection in the room. So with everybody playing the way that they are in the session, it seems like a great choice. Okay, so this is the next one that we wanna see. So this is Brian and he's playing his Gibson and we got a big old Neumann U67 right on that Gibson. So let's go in here and we've got guitars. So acoustic, we have a U67 on that acoustic and let's go see if we can figure out what that guitar is. So Gibson, Oh, Gibson Acoustic 60s. And what I'm looking for, I'll go back and show you. But if we go back to this first video that we watched here where they're all hanging out, what I'm looking for is this. You see how in the bridge of his guitar, there is this it's very hard to see because it keeps popping up this thing here, but there's perloid. This bridge is wide and it's butterflied and it's got perloid sunk into that bridge, which this guitar does not have. So let's go see what we can find. So the first page are giving us a bunch of J45s and stuff like that, which I don't think it is. Let's put in fancy bridge. See if that gets us where we want to go. Yup. <laughs> so we're looking at probably something like one of these SJ200s that said that does look like it's just the wood shining through instead of perloid. So I could have been confused about that. But let's go and compare this to Brian's guitar. That still looks like there's pearl in that bridge. That said, it does look like it's matching one of these SJs. So let's go and put in Gibson SJ 60s. Either way, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. It's not the end of the world for me. I'm, oh, there we go. Yep, so they made those SJ200s with Pearl on the bridge. I'm just not seeing them, yes. So, yep, it's a SJ200. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's keep going. Bill on the Maraca with a U67. There's a couple things happening percussion wise, but there's a U67, so we're putting that down. Here you can see that C414 again. Here you can see Mick playing away with the D D224. There's a great shot of that SJ with that bridge that I was talking about. So this is one of my, my favorite clips because you can see him playing his Les Paul Custom. You can see that he's on the neck pickup and the amplifier that was over here was an AC30 that had a small diaphragm Neumann on it. Let's go back and see if we can see that. So that's guitar, lead, Les Paul Custom. Neck pickup, which 
it doesn't sound like to me, but that's what it looks like. So I'm writing it down. And then let's go back to our first video where we could see a very clear example of that amplifier when they panned. Was it earlier? Yep. Boom, AC30. And that almost looks like it could be a D19. It doesn't look like a straight condenser. It's got a bulbous front. I'm putting D19 on my notes, which that does kind of lend to the sound because it is a very thin, bright sound. AKG um, and Fox AC30. AKG D19. And, you know, let's look on the floor and see if we see any petals hanging out over there by that thing. And let's go back to our other video because you can see where these two amps are. And you can see where this cable's running. So this is the amp that we haven't seen yet. This is that foundation and this cable is running over to here. So again, Keith with his Les Paul. <coughs> you can tell I think it's going to that AC30 even more too because look at how they have <laughs> a baffle right in front of where that AC30 was before. I bet you that thing was ripping everybody's fucking heads off. <laughs> Throwing cigarettes. <laughs> Doing overdubs with a speaker. Okay, so this is great because you can see this is like, as they're writing, the session progresses. And you can see that we have a guy over here on a keyboard we got Bill playing bass, we've got people playing drums, and we've got Keith playing his guitar with no shoes on. But we know from video footage that, that that's not the take that ended up being the take used. Um, let's go, there's a great, there's another video we gotta check out, which is, we'll copy this. Go to videos and maybe it's music video. It's not the official one. Let's click this and see if we get to it. This one. So. <clears throat> You can see here on, on the drum kit, we have another small diaphragm condenser Neumann coming down over the uh, floor tom area. And if you look here, you can tell that was the one that was on the, the stand that was pointed towards the snare drum earlier. So that guy is going to be put on the list. And if I had to guess, looking at that, that looks like a Neumann KM54. Yep. It, it could... Almost looks like those... Gr that grill is slotted the other way. Uh, would that be a 53? Yeah, like that. It's either a 54 or 53. Either way, I think it's a small diaphragm condenser Neumann. So, Tom's. Neumann KM 53 or 54 up way high. 
So that thing has a lot of space between it and the floor tom. So making a note of that, no snare mic. So I don't think there's a snare mic on this song. So this video also will show us something great, which is Keith actually laying down the bass part of this song. Let's keep going. So vocals, we forgot to make a note. Scratch vocal was the AKG D224. Okay, so we're, we're seeing this closer now. This foundation, I don't think it's a 215, I think it's a 115. Also, we're getting into some stuff here, but look at Keith playing the bass. So background vocals, you can see they're using this for a monitor and we have a sing single U67. The thing that's also interesting is below the 67, so vocals, BGs, U67. But if you look closely, There's a AKG D, what would that be? 30, maybe? Yeah, something like that. Um, and I know that they made some of those AKG microphones that could be multi-pattern. Um, I don't know if it was the D30 but it was probably something along those lines that was a multi-pattern AKG large diaphragm condenser micro or large diaphragm dynamic microphone. And what's interesting about those microphones is a lot of people think of these as kick drum style microphones, but they were actually originally intended for vocal microphones. And we've seen them sh showing up a couple spots. And it makes me think, were these utilized by the studio for some sort of MS configuration or something like that? Or were they utilized by the film production crew in the way that they were used as boom microphones in the Twickenham footage that the Beatles put out? So that said, we'll make note that the mic is there. Okay, let's continue on down the video.
So that's the actual vocal mic. I love their pop filter. Let's go ahead and put that up. That's a U67. I'll call it lead vocal. Southern Jumbo, 67. So I love this photo of them when they're laying down this, this big, you know, backing track because I think this gives away. Oh, here it is. So officially, I think. Look at this cable. Look at how this cable drapes. Look at it. Watch the bounce. It bounces higher than the amp, which means that it's going up to this DI that's sitting up here on top of here and then going to the amplifier. So yes, there is a DI. Okay, we got a couple things we haven't checked out. There's a piano happening throughout the song. So there's congas over here. And that looks black up there, and that looks silver. I'm gonna assume that those are C414s by looking at <laughs> the way that they hang out at almost a straight right angle. Percussion, congas. Oh, here's the piano. Let's hope we can see it. So we have a single Neumann microphone, small diaphragm, it looks like. Uh, I'm gonna guess 254. We have a stereo microphone hanging out way over here. I don't think that with everything that would be going on that that would be more than general ambience, but it's kind of close to the piano. We also have a Coles 4038 that's hanging out over here, but that looks like it could be more of a talkback microphone than it is the piano microphone. What's interesting is when I listen, I don't hear too much of the low notes from the piano. I do hear the higher runs, the dinolin, dinolin, dinolins, which seem to be right where that range of that is. I'm going to go with Neumann KM54 uh, keys. Yep, you can see that cable still hanging out higher than the DI. So there's lots of great footage of this session, and it's wonderful that it's been captured, but this is how I go and learn. I go and see things that happened or try and listen to people who were there, and, you know, I will go and I will try microphones 
like this in the same places on similar sounding songs and equipment and you know see where i end up some of these things that they did are definitely not my first choice you know a vox foundation with a 115 mic'd with a akg c414 is definitely not what i would consider a classic bass rig but it's one of the most classic bass sounds that's ever been recorded so for me, you know, there's really no right or wrong way to do this. Anything could con constitute a hit, but going and seeing what our predecessors did and how we arrived where we are today has always helped me. And I just wanted to show you guys a little bit about how I did that. So if this is something that you guys enjoyed and you would like to see more of it, please, Recommend some stuff below. Let us know what you want to learn about because we want to check it out too. Thanks and have a great day.